Okay, I've uh, been blessed with this cold for the whole week. And uh, could be far worse. If you have your copy of the Bible, turn to Matthew chapter 27 this morning. We are continuing on. We're getting there. And we're going to talk this morning about the murder of the Savior. Now, our title looks like an oxymoron. How can a Savior be murdered and still be a Savior? But that's our God. Amen? Amen. And uh, so our murdered Savior rises from the dead and saves us. We'll talk about that later. But uh, last week we saw Jesus on trial before Pilate, and we saw uh, him being totally rejected by the Jews, obviously. Uh, and in fact, not only did they reject Jesus, they accepted Barabbas. And we learned uh, last week that Barabbas was an ins ins insurrectionist. He was also uh, a noted criminal. He was also uh, referred to in Scripture as a murderer. And they chose him over the Savior. And all of us would be thinking that was just craziness. Uh, but, you know, the Bible tells us that he would come first to the Jews and they would reject him and then to the Gentiles. Praise God. So um, today we see Matthew's view or version of the crucifixion. I, uh, just a reminder, you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, four Gospels. In the Gospels, there are many portions of Scripture that, that talk about the same subject, and this is one of them. And when you talk about the same subject, sometimes there's a different version, not because the, the, the story's wrong, but because they've got four different people writing about the same subject. Uh, Luke writes a lot. Luke was a doctor, okay? And so he writes a lot more about the physical pain and so on and so forth. So when we read Matthew today, I don't want you to get caught up in the idea, well, I didn't see where it says so and so or such and such, and it may not in, in Matthew. It may say it somewhere else. And we're not going to have time today to jump all over the place chasing all of those down, uh, but you're more than welcome to do it at home. Uh, but we're going to begin reading in verse 27 of chapter 27. And what we're going to do this morning, we're just going to read a few verses to get us started, and then we'll read the verses as we go along. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole battalion before him, and they stripped him, and they put a scarlet robe on him, and they twisted together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand, and kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit on him, and they took the reed, and they struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and put on his own clothes back on him and led him away to crucify him. So we see Pilate says, okay, you have a choice, Barabbas or Jesus. They take Barabbas. Now Jesus is led away by the soldiers uh, for crucifixion. So the first thing we see this morning is the de degradation of the Savior. The degradation of the Savior, the humiliation, and all that takes place right here. So that's the first thing we see is the place of humiliation. And it says the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the, the headquarters. That's called the praetorium. They took him into the praetorium. This was an area... Uh, like a courtyard where they would have gatherings and such like that. And now let me tell you how big it was, because this is interesting. It says they gathered the whole battalion. A battalion was one-tenth of a legion, and a legion is 6,000 soldiers. So a battalion would be 600, good math there, 600. Uh, and they, so there's 600 uh, soldiers in this praetorium, in this area. This is not a small area. This is big. There's 600 people uh, there, plus maybe anybody else. We don't know who all, but we know these guys were. And so that's the place. Then we see the act of humiliation, verses 28 through 30. And look what they did. I want you to notice the, the humiliation here. They stripped him. So first of all, he's standing there before 600 guys, and they took all of his clothes off of him. And they put a scarlet robe. Uh, that would be something that a king would wear because they're going to mock him, as we already know on him, and he twisted together a crown of thorns. Now, I want to tell you, that in its own self is a major feat. 
Uh, in my office, I have a crown of thorns that I made. I found a thorn bush. I weaved it together years ago. We've used it in dramas and so on and so forth. And I want you to know that crown of thorns ate my hands up just putting it together. So whoever did this, uh, you know, it took some effort to do it. And it said they twisted together a crown of thorns, and they put it on his head, and they put a reed in his right hand, and then they knelt before him. Look what it says. They mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit on him. And, of course, in Bible days, spitting was the sign of disgust. But you didn't spit on people. You spit on the ground. So if you were talking to someone and they didn't like what you were saying, they would spit on the ground. But here they spit on him. And it says, they spit on him. They took the reed and they struck him on the head. Think about it. He's already got what on his head? A crown of thorns. And now he gets struck on the head. Verse 28 through 30 uh, should, should hurt your heart, at least some. As you realize, this all happened because he was an innocent guy who claimed to be the son of God, which is true. And he did this all for, for me. And so they struck him on the head. So they degraded him as much as they could. But what they didn't know was they were fulfilling prophecy. Isaiah 52, 14, I put the text there for you. It says his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of a ch a children of mankind. So what they were doing, and they're beating him up, and, and we already know they beat him before. We talked about that. And, and now uh, the humiliation and all this, this is all fulfillment of Scripture. And it might have caught a lot of people off guard, but guess who it didn't catch off guard? Jesus. Look at verse 31. And when they had mocked him, they, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes back on him and led him away to crucify him. And so the completion of humiliation. This was their, they did what they wanted to do here. Um, this was their sport of sort, uh, mocking and, and beating Jesus. And the whole time he remained silent. Do you remember back in the story of uh, Samson? It said they made sport of him. The Bible says they made sport of him. They used him as a sport uh, issue, like they, they making fun of him. And that's exactly what happened with Jesus. First Peter gives us these words in chapter 2, verse 23. When he was reviled, he did not vile in return. When they were going after him, he didn't do anything back. Okay? It says when he suffered, he, was, he did not threaten them. Uh, but he continually entrusted himself, and we talked, we read this verse last week. He continued to trust himself to, to the one who judges justly, which is the Father. And so we see the degradation of the Savior. Nobody on the whole face of the planet should ever have to go through this. But definitely not an innocent man, and definitely not on behalf of somebody else, but he did it. He did it for you and I. The second thing I want us to notice is in verses 32 through 38, <coughs> and we see the crucifixion of the Savior. Now, Matthew gives us a limited view of things that happened when Jesus was taken to be crucified. So you're going to see things that aren't, you say, well, there's things missing here. Well, it's just missing in Matthew's version. You can read it in Mark or Luke or John. But we find in verse 32, it says, as they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, uh, Simeon by name, or excuse me, Simon by name, and they compelled uh, this man to carry his cross. And when they came to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. So the first thing we see is the place of the crucifixion. Now, I've heard preachers say that this was a cemetery. It was not a cemetery. Uh, people get the wrong idea here because of the term, uh, it says Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Uh, I've seen pictures of this area, and I've had friends who have been to Israel. I've never been there. But as said, that when you look at it, it looks like a skull. There's like a skull in the side of the mountain. Even here in our country, uh, there are places that have names because of what it looks like. And maybe you go there and you're like, I don't get that. Well, that doesn't matter. Somebody did and they named it that. Okay? But this is a place of the crucifixion, Golgotha. And so he's taken there. And as he's going there, he, can't, he physically cannot take, carry the cross anymore, which, by the way, we often see the view of the whole cross being drugged. Well, that's not what happened because the, the beam that goes up and down that sits in the ground stayed there. They just put the cross beam uh, on, the, on the prisoner and then put it up there 
and nailed it fast. And so he would be carrying a cross beam. It'd be a pretty good size, but he couldn't carry it anymore. And the Bible tells us there's a guy they choose by a guy from Cyrene. Cyrene is a northern part of Africa where a lot of Jewish people lived. And he was probably there for the, the, the festival that we've been talking about. And uh, so his name was Simon. And they said, you carry the cross or the cross beam, which he did. And they go to the place of the skull. The second thing I want you to notice in verses 34 and 36 is the act of crucifixion. They offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. They did that in those days to dull the pain. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. Then they sat down and kept watch over him. Now, I don't know. When you read this text, I don't know what it means to you. Okay, but let's just look at a couple things. First of all, they tried to, to dull the pain. And, and the Bible tells us that Jesus didn't take it. Uh, he, he was willing to suffer for our sin. Yes, amen. Okay. And it says that when they, de- when they crucified him, they divided his garments. We're thinking, think about what you're seeing here. We're, we're, these are soldiers that, you know, they take his garments back off of him and they divide them. You know, they're going to, you know, we'll use these. The guy, he's still alive. He's still hanging on the cross. We'll take these. Look at verse 36. Then they sat down and kept watch over him. I don't know. There's a part of that that kind of like just, first of all, the whole picture is kind of gross. I think most people would have an you know, a, a upset stomach at least by now. There's a man dying, uh, actually three of them, but Jesus is dying on the cross. And they sit down and, you know, I got this picture that they, you know, may, maybe called up. Uh, one of the food delivery services to have lunch come. I mean, I, I know that there wasn't such a thing in the Bible days, but you see th- just the, the average norm, if I can put it that way, of sitting and watching somebody die in pain and suffering. If you were to find your dog suffering, most of us would immediately take the dog to the vet and try to get it help, would we not? Okay, your dog or your cat, you would take and get help. And here's a man suffering, and we, we're just going to sit down here and watch and see what's happening. Take it all in. I don't know. There's a part of that that makes me want to run back into time and run up to the soldiers and hit them with a stick uh, because it's just disgusting. But that's a fulfillment of Scripture. Psalm twenty-two, eighteen: 18. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. And so again, even though they're doing their little thing, they're fulfilling scripture itself. Verse 37, and over his head, they put the charge against him, which read, this is Jesus, king of the Jews. And so we see the charge for crucifixion. We have the place, we have the act, and we have the charge. What they would do, this placard over their head would tell why they were being crucified. So people going by, see, you got to keep in mind, first of all, uh, Romans never crucified Romans. Romans only crucified other people. And when they did it, they wanted it to be one of those things that stood out, that everybody would see and know so that it would deter them. They used it as a deterrent from other people doing the same crime. And believe me, nobody's going to do this crime because he truly was the son of God. He truly is the son of God. Praise his name. But they put over his head that the charge against him is that this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. So I just have to wonder, unless there's a battle in wartime and, and, and a leader is captured, how many people were crucified in all of world history because they were a king of something? Probably not a whole lot. But here's a guy who's crucified for something that's true. Because he is the king of the Jews. But the Jewish leaders that hated him with a passion, they didn't want that up there. And if you turned over to John chapter 19, you can read there for yourself. But verses 21 and 22, it says the priest, the chief priests of the Jews, these are the ones that wanted him crucified. They go to Pilate and said, hey, do not write that he is the king of the Jews, but rather write this man said, I'm the king of the Jews. And Pilate said, what I've written, I've written. And that's what was on the cross. 
the charge for the crucifixion. So we see the degradation of the crucifixion or the Savior, and we see the crucifixion of the Savior, and then we, we're not done yet because we have more mocking of the Savior. Number three, we have the mocking of the Savior. Verses 38 uh, and continue. And those who passed, we're going to jump to 39, by the way. We'll come back to 38. Then those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. And so the first thing we see is the onlookers mocking Jesus. They're walking by. They're shaking their head. They're just shaking their head. Can't believe it. You know, and then they even go further than that. They say, hey, you who said you could destroy the temple in three days and uh, destroy the temple and build it back in three days, you know, why aren't you doing something? Guess what? He is. Because he's not talking about the physical building. He's talking about his temple, temple of God. And so it says here uh, they, that you derided him and so on and so forth. I want you to look at the term in verse 40 that we see. It says, if you are the son of God, they are doubting his deity. Jesus has said multiple times that he is the son of God. And they said, if you really are the son of God, they're doubting his deity. Do you realize this morning that if you doubt the deity of Christ, if you doubt who Jesus is, you cannot know him as your savior. And so when you look at these people, they are, they're doomed because they're doubting who he is. And they're even actually putting him into a category that uh, is all throughout the whole, the whole New Testament. It's called false teachers. They're saying, you're not really the son of God or you bring yourself down. So you must be a false teacher. Hmm. It's interesting when you study the books of Paul's writings and, and the other epistles and you find in those writings... Uh, the warning about false teachers and what a false teacher looks like, and then you lay that down next to Jesus, guess what? Not even close. Because what Jesus taught was truth. What the false teachers taught was lies. Look what else happens here in verse 41. So also the chiefs, priests with the scribes, and the elders mocked him. Now the chief priests and the scribes are there, and they're mocking him, saying, he saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he desires him, for he said, I am the son of God. I don't know. If, you, if we had time this morning, I'd like to really spend time right here. We're not going to because uh, it would take too much time. But these two scriptures uh, talk about the religious leaders mocking Jesus, Okay. Now, I want you to look at them. I want to read them again slowly. I want you to look at a few things that, that stand out. First of all, the chief priests. These are the most, and the scribes, these are the most educated Jewish leaders living at the time. They should know the Old Testament. They should understand that through the Old Testament, from the very beginning of Genesis all the way through, there's woven that red thread that I have talked about over and over again over the years that says the Messiah is coming, Jesus is coming. They should know that. These are the guys making fun and mocking him. Look at verse 42. He saved others. He cannot save himself. You know what they're really saying is all those people that think they're saved aren't. They're not only mocking Jesus. They're mocking those who sa he saved others. Look at the next part. He is the king of Israel. Uh, or excuse me. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross and we will believe in him. If he really is who he says he is, let him come down from the cross and we will believe in him. How many of you this morning believe that if Jesus came off the cross, they would have believed in him? Raise your hand. Okay. I don't know if you looked around, but guess how many hands were up? Zero. You know why it's zero? Because he's already had multiple, multiple, multiple things he has shown them of miracles, of raising people from the dead, from healing people, from rebuking uh, evil spirits, and on and on. And guess what? They did not believe. They did not believe. And so they're not going to believe if he came down off the cross. And by the way, when he rose on the third day and he went ahead and spent 40 days on the earth, did they believe? No. 
And so this is not true. This isn't going to happen. What they say, you know, if you come down, uh, we'll believe you. Look at the next part. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down. Then look what it says. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he desires him. For he said, I am the son of God. Who are they making fun of now? They're making fun of God. Look at what they're saying there. This, it's interesting because they were even afraid to use the name God because they, they revered God. But they're not revering God too much right here in verse 43 because their trust should be in God too that they're doing the right thing. Obviously, they're not, and their trust isn't in God. And it says, for, I, for he said, I am the Son of God. They're, they're mocking Jesus and the Father here. Many signs Jesus did, and they still wanted more confirmation. And so we see there <clears throat> the mocking of the Savior by the religious leaders. The third one we see is back to verse 38 and down to verse 44. We're going to put them together here. Then the two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And the robbers, verse 44, and the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. And so we see the robbers mocked Jesus. So we have the onlookers who just walking by. We have the religious leaders who know better. And now we have the robbers who are hanging on the cross beside Jesus. I have always found this scripture interesting because I'm thinking to myself, hey, hey, you nitwits, you're going to die. You are hung up there to die. And they're going to light you there until you die or they'll break your legs and stick you with a spear because they want you to die and you're making fun of Jesus? Did you ever just for a moment think maybe he is the answer and you should at least like be nice to him? I mean, nobody on the ground's going, hey, hey, that's cool, those two thieves, they're mocking him too, that's great. You're making yourself look like bigger idiots than you really were. You, you see what I mean? And it says here that they both did it. But there's good news. Because even though they had no hope, they joined the crowd to make fun of Jesus. But in Luke chapter 23, the Bible tells us there that one of them had a change of heart. I'm just going to read you two of the verses there. The thief said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, you are making fun of me. You can die and go to hell. Is that true? No. Jesus looked over to the thief and said, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Hallelujah. What a savior we have. Right down to the last minute, even mocking him, even making fun of him, wanting nothing to do with him, and then realize he's the real thing. He is Jesus. And Jesus said, come on home. There's going to be a lot of people who are going to arrive in heaven because they accepted Christ at the very last second. And there's going to be a lot of people in hell because they had that last second and walked away. Verse 45 through 50 talks about the death of the Savior. Probably the saddest part of the whole story right here. Verse 45, now from the sixth hour, which would be noon, okay, the Jewish clock started at 6 a.m., our starts at midnight. Our start at 6 a.m. So the sixth hour would be noon, okay? So tomorrow when you go to work, if you go really, really early and it's 6 o'clock, just tell the boss I'm taking my lunch time. And the pastor said the sixth hour is lunch, so I ain't taking my lunch time. Now don't give me my name or my phone number. Okay, so anyway, sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land. What that really means is all of the earth was dark, okay? I don't want us to think there was just this little darkness like, you know, a cloud came by because that's not what happened until the ninth hour. So if the sixth hour is noon, what time is the ninth hour? Three o'clock. Okay, so we have three hours of total darkness. Now, I don't know about you, but have you ever been in a really, really bad storm when day daylight becomes almost completely pitch dark? Is it spooky? It's kind of a little freaky, isn't it? Oh, most of you are macho here. Don't bother you. But anyway, it does. 
And so we have this period of darkness, verse 46, and about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which interpreted means, my God, my God, why hath you forsaken me? Now, I don't know if you've ever thought about what this says, but I want you to know this morning, this is the first time in all of history and the last time in all of history that the son was separated from the father. It's the separation of the Savior. He said to his father, why have you forsaken me? And of course, the Bible tells us that uh, it was necessary for God to turn his back on his son because his son just took on the whole load of sin for all of mankind. You know, I've thought about this many times and thought about how when I have sin in my heart and I'm not quick to confess it, I have that load of guilt. You all know what I mean? The load of guilt that you know you're wrong and you need to take care of it. The load of guilt. Can you imagine the load of guilt for all of the world and you did nothing? Jesus did nothing to deserve this load, this separation of his father. But in order to save us, he did it. He experienced the separation that will never happen again, praise God. It was overwhelming to him. I think we see that very, very clearly here. He bore the sin of all humanity. And Peter gives us a verse about it in chapter 3, verse 18. He says, Christ died once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Do you realize that when you come to Jesus and accept him as your savior, you're made alive in the spirit? Amen? You're a new creature, the Bible says. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. You know when you get up in the morning and you have all that aspiration of what you're going to do for the day and you're all excited and then 15 seconds later you've lost your perspiration and you're done. Okay? But that first thing in the morning when you're all excited about, you know, that's the way spiritually we are. Not for 15 seconds, but for all of the rest of our lives. Salvation doesn't begin when you and I die. Salvation be uh, began when we accepted Jesus as our Savior. We have eternal life with Jesus Christ. And we are charged, we are filled by the presence of his spirit. And Peter says, listen, Christ died once for sins, for all sins. He has set us free. This is that separation that took place. Verse 47 through 49 talks about the misunderstanding of the Savior. And some of the bystanders hearing it said, this man is calling Elijah. One of them at once ran and took a sponge and filled it with sour wine and put it on the reed and gave it to him to drink. But uh, the other said, wait, let's see whether Elijah comes to save him. This is kind of a, I don't know. This, when I read some of this stuff in scripture, I'm like, wow, where were these people's heads, you know? Obviously, it wasn't on their shoulders, that's for sure. But anyway, some of the bystanders said, hey, do you hear what he's, you hear what he's saying? And it's, uh, now I don't speak Aramaic or even understand it. But I did some research, and the word Elijah and the word Eloi, Eloi Sabathani, the, the, the term, uh, my God, my God, and Elijah are very close together in that language. And so it could be very easily construed. Verse 48, the guy goes and gets a sponge uh, and fills it with sour wine and put it, because thought he's got a dry mouth. If we get his mouth wet, maybe we can understand what he's saying. And of course, Jesus doesn't accept it. But the others are like, hey. Let's watch and see if Elijah shows up. You know what's really cool about this? Elijah is going to show up. Not here, but later on. When the two prophets come, during the tribulation, one of them is Elijah. And guess what they're going to do to him? They're going to kill him. See, Jeremiah 17, 9 is so correct. And I repeat this verse to myself multiple times a day because we live in a world that is desperately wicked. Desperately wicked. That's why we look at the news and we're like, what? Because we are desperately wicked. The 
they misunderstood what was going on here. They thought Jesus was calling for help, but the truth of the matter was he was saying to the Father, I, I want to do what you told me to do. Verse 50, and Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. So what did he say? Well, Luke tells us what he says. In Luke 23, 46, then Jesus calling out with a loud voice said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last and he died. You know, the Old Testament tells us that they would not break his legs and they would not kill him with a spear. He died. Yes, they stabbed him with a spear, but he was already dead. We see the surrender of the Savior. Here's the perfect Son of God, the Holy Son of God, the righteous Son of God is hanging between heaven and earth on a cross and he gave up his life for you and for me. He left the throne room of heaven. He was separated from the Father. He was totally misunderstood almost the whole time he was on the earth. And he chose to give his life for you and I. His life was not taken. He gave it. I want to give you a couple of quick thoughts here. First of all, Jesus was in complete control of his life right to the very end. Satan did manipulate time. Man didn't manipulate time. Jesus was in control right to the very end. Jesus died at the precise moment he was supposed to. Do you remember the soldier said, you know, uh, the, 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 uh, the chief priest, the Sanhedrin said, we don't want to take him during the festival because there'll be a lot of visitors here, but guess when they took him? Not because it was on their timetable, because it was on God's timetable. I want you to never forget something this morning, that Jesus' life was not taken. He gave it. He laid down his life. Not only did he lay it down, he later on took it up, the Bible tells us. Because his life gives us a guarantee of, of life. That blessed hope, the glory superior of our Lord. And the whole period of time this all was happening even when he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Everything that happened that scripture gives us was in total obedience to the father. He totally obeyed his father to the end. That's my Jesus. The death of the savior. So we're going to finish this morning with three, uh, four events that happened because of the death of the savior. Verses 51 through 54. Actually, I'm sorry, 56. In verse 51, it says, Behold, the curtain of the temple is torn in two from top to bottom. Now, you know, I've heard this preached about and talked about for years, and, you know, uh, it wasn't until I really started studying Scripture numerous years ago that I really realized the significance of this taking place. First of all, the, the, the curtain that we're talking about, or in the Old Testament, I mean in the uh, old versions of the Bible, they called it a veil, is not something thin. It actually was the width of a man's hand, this wide. This is not something that somebody grabbed a hold of and pulled a string and it all fell off. You know, sometimes you, get, you pull a, screen, a string on your shirt and your arm falls off, right? The sleeve falls off. That's not what happens here. This is a major event that takes place. And it says the veil was, or the curtain was tore from the top to the bottom, signifying only one important thing, that the only way it got tore was by God. God did this. From the top to the bottom. And the whole significance of this veil being tore is God saying, welcome. It gives us access to the very throne room of God. In the Old Testament, if you wanted to pray, you had to pray through a priest. If you wanted to offer a, a sacrifice through a priest, you had to worship through a priest. And now Jesus is the high priest. And he has opened the veil to the throne room of God. When you bow your head this morning and say, Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father is listening. You don't need a priest. You don't need me. All you need is you. Hallelujah. And when you say to the Heavenly Father, this is my need, praise God.
The Heavenly Father is God. He's right there. He's listening to you. You've entered the very throne room of God because the veil has been tore from the top to the bottom. Hallelujah. Early this morning, our family, there's seven of us kids, and our family all got a text message saying, pray. One of my nieces has been in labor since Friday, and she was having some, uh, they were having some issues, and said, pray. And that was, I don't know what time it was exactly, but anyway, we prayed, and while we were practicing on the worship team this morning, I got a text of this beautiful little boy. Because when the seven of us prayed, guess where we went? Right to the throne room. Nobody said, wait till I get to church and ask the pastor. Nobody said, you know, I need to talk to a priest. We went right to the throne room. God hears and answers prayer. Because the temple is torn from the top to the bottom. Look what happens in verse 51. And the earth shook and the rocks were split. Why is this significance? Because the one who created all that is Jesus. The Bible tells us he's a creator. And his death on Calvary affected all creation. But there's good news. When he returns on the Mount of Olives, guess what his return is going to do? Affect all of creation. Hallelujah. What a day, huh? And we're going to be with him, praise the Lord. If you know Jesus, you're going to be there when the earth separates. The Bible says there's going to be a whole new uh, landscape instantly because the, the Son of God touches his feet on the Mount of Olives. I don't, I, just, I don't know. I can't wait for this stuff to happen because it's like, that's really cool. I've seen some really neat things happen in my life, but there ain't going to be nothing like what we're going to see later. Praise God. Look at verse 52 and 53. And the tombs were also open, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep or who had died were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. The tombs were open. The tombs were open. And, you know, there's a lot of discussion about what exactly this means and who they were. But I think Scripture gives us a pretty good picture here. Let's look at what it says. How many tombs were open? What's it say? Many, not all. Not all, okay? It says many were opened. And it says, uh, who, who, was, who was raised? Saints. Who was a saint? A believer, a born-again Christian is a saint. Who were these people? These were people who had died before, and they were raised, okay? And it says, and they came out of the tomb. When did they come out of their tombs? After Jesus. How, how, why did it have to be after Jesus? Because Jesus is the first fruit. Jesus is the first fruit. His resurrection, him raising himself up, the first fruit, proves to us that all of us will be raised up. Amen? And so I don't have any doubt if I croak and they bury me down here in the cemetery that someday, hallelujah, praise God, I'm going to come right up out of the ground. Okay, not because I'm really tough and strong, I can't even get up off the ground right now. But I'm going to fly out of the ground because Jesus raised himself. He can raise me. And, that, and so it says here, after his resurrection, that he went into the holy city and appeared to many. I, 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 well, this has got to be, this is a whole sermon in itself, but think about it. You're just tooling around. Maybe you're one of those doubters thinking, praise God, or, you know, that Jesus dude is gone. And here comes your relative that, you went to the funeral. Because it says they were seen by many. And so do you notice here how many people came to Jesus because they saw their lost loved ones get saved? Or, I mean, raised up? There's not a record of any. See, this whole idea that if I can get a sign, my life will change is false because the Bible's full of signs and people still reject the Savior. Like Lazarus and like Jairus' daughter, and of course, like the widow that we find in the book of Luke, they all died again. But they're going to get raised up again, praise God. And then the last one is verses 54 and 56 through 56. When the centurion and all those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe. Seriously? Yes, I assume so. And it said, truly, this was the Son of God. Hmm. You know what they were really saying? We have never seen a crucifixion like this before. 
verse 55. There were many, or excuse me, there were also many women there looking on from the distance who had followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him. Among them were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of son of Zebedee. And we know uh, from the book of John that uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus, was there. So what else happened because of this? The onlookers. The onlookers noticed the people, this whole thing that happened with the, 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 the earthquake and, and the tombs, and uh, it got attention. It got attention. The women of faith who saw Jesus and who truly believed had to be crushed, had to be brokenhearted to sit there and watch the one that they loved with all their heart and believed and followed and trusted to be crucified. But... As S.M. Lockridge said, Sunday is coming. The story gets better. Amen? Amen. And we're going to pick up next week right there. We covered a lot of ground today, and I know we did. There's just really, in the book of Matthew, not a whole lot of place to stop when it comes to the murder of the Savior I want you to notice this morning something very important that maybe you never thought about before, but when Jesus hung on Calvary, he hung on Calvary for you. For you and for you and for you and yeah, for me. He died on the cross that all of us could have eternal life. There is no reason for hell to be full of unbelievers. There isn't. Because Jesus has paved the way. He said earlier, we studied, he said, I am the way the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And he made the way. Jesus just didn't say that is the way. You know, we can get directions from people and they tell you, go that way, go this way, whatever. If you're ever down south and you get directions, pray. You know, you know where that big oak tree is next to the guy that's got the two goats and the tractor's parked there? Make a left. Okay, and just continue a little ways and you're going to see where the pipe goes under the road and over to the right is where that old outhouse is and it's not there, keep going. Yeah, um, I live down south. Anyway, um, I love those people, but their directions are, are challenging. See, we can, get, uh, we can get directions, but that's not what Jesus did. Jesus didn't say, here's the direction. Jesus said, follow me. Jesus said, I'm going to make the way for you to have eternal life. Follow me. Jesus didn't tell you to follow the pastor. He didn't tell you to follow some guy on TV or some woman you know or your grandparents. He said, follow me. And if you're sitting here this morning and you say, Pastor, I'm not sure if I die today, I'm going to be with Jesus. Let me just ask you a really simple question. Are you following Jesus? Because that's where your attention needs to be. And it's not that hard. It is not that hard. Amen? It is not that hard. It's simply realizing that you are not qualified to go anywhere on your own but directly to hell. Because the Bible says we are desperately wicked. The Bible says we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says that the, the penalty for sin is death. That's what you deserve. That's what I deserve. That's what we all deserve. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus said, even before you were thought of, I paid the price on Calvary for you. It's so easy to say to Jesus, I need you as my Savior. Please save me. And if you say it with your heart, surrendering totally to him, he does it. Hallelujah. If you're here this morning and you need to talk to somebody, I will be glad to talk to you. But please, don't leave here today with questions about where you're going to spend eternity because you don't know when your eternity is going to start. Lord, we come before you this morning first on behalf of of everybody in this room, may we sense from your spirit the teaching of the word of God.
may we realize that what you did that day on Calvary for us was something we as Christians can rejoice over. But at the same point, we should say, take so very, very seriously and realize that we have the message that can change people's lives every day. And we need to make a difference in the world we live. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, if there's one person in this room this morning that doesn't know you, or somebody watching by live stream today that does not know you, Lord, may your spirit direct their paths. May your spirit speak to their heart. May they surrender their soul to you today. May they leave here. May they quit watching whatever may be happening, knowing without a doubt that I am ready to meet Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise your name. We love you, Lord. We thank you in your precious name. Amen.